thank you all, and uh, thank you, Moremi and Nikki. Uh, what an introduction. Um, I also want to use this opportunity to thank the Rachel Carson Center um, for hosting us, and obviously all the Landhaus Fellows for many fruitful and controversial discussions at the Landhaus. And certainly the biggest shout out goes to my two Congolese research partners, um, Saidi Kubuya Batundi and Jean-Mier Kaikolo, without whom I would certainly not be giving this talk today, um, which is titled Infrastructural Frontiers, Development and Contestation in North Kivu, a Fieldwork Report. And as the title implies, this is a fieldwork report, so please keep that in mind, as it's not going to be very theoretical, but more empirically grounded. Um, my presentation follows this outline. Uh, I'm going to start with a short introduction to North Kivu. Then I'm going to explain um, Virunga National Park and the rationale of their infrastructure development. And then I'm going to finish by taking you to my field site um, and explaining three uh, major dynamics that stood out for me during my time there. Uh, these are infra this is the infrastructural frontier, a resource extraction frontier, and a rebel frontier. Um, I'm going to start with introducing you to North Kivu. So North Kivu is one of the 26 provinces of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, which is often portrayed as a failed or underdeveloped state. That is, for example, 98% of the rural population in Congo still live without electricity. Now the notion of a failed or underdeveloped state has also frequently been used in relation to the country's east, where North Kivu is located. Um, and North Kivu is truly a magical place of outstanding natural beauty. Um, it features active and extinct volcanoes, vast savanna areas, um, mountains as high as 5,000 meters, um, and sheer endless tropical rainforest. And it also features um, enormous mineral riches. Um, but despite all these natural riches, it is frequently uh, associated with Ebola. Um, it's depicted as a place of murder and lawless lawlessness, where justice and law seem to be absent. It has been dubbed the rape capital of the world, the heart of darkness, and is portrayed as a place where warlords high on opium wage war against the local population. While all of this is fiction, what is actually true is that North Kivu and the East host the deadliest war since the Second World War with a death toll of approximately 5 million people over the last 30 years. Now, this has led to a rather simplistic narrative of conflict minerals. Um, that means that rebels subdue the local population and force them to work in mines to extract mineral resources, which are then shipped to the West and end up in our smartphones. So the narrative is that when you buy a smartphone, you will actively, so you actively support rebels and child, child soldiers and rape in Eastern Congo. And this narrative has gained a lot of traction in the Western media and led to the enactment um, of the Dodd-Frank Act in 2010 by the US government where section 1502 states that all publicly listed companies have to make their supply chains completely transparent. While this is in theory a good idea, it didn't really help the situation in North Kivu. So this is the map of armed groups in 2009. So this is a year before the enactment of the Dodd-Frank Act in the United States. This is the map of armed groups in 2015. This is 2018. This is 2019. And this is North Kivu in October 2020. So we see that the Dodd-Frank Act didn't really help anything. Um, but rather, rebel groups proliferated in the region and it became incredibly dynamic. Um, so I arrived in North Kivu in uh, April 2022. Um, I think this might be. So 
So I was based down here in Goma, and my field research was supposed to take place in Ruchuru territory, close to Ruchuru. Um, but because of a situation that I'm going to explain in a second, I had to relocate my field research further north, close to Lubero territory, where I was about 40 kilometers northeast, uh, sorry, northwest of Lubero Center here. Um, and why did I have to do that? Because of the resurgence of the MT M23 rebel group, which is a rebel group that is backed by the Rwandan government, and that triggered the severest crisis in the past 20 years, with, with hundreds of thousands um, of new internally displaced people. Um, and I'm going to quickly play that. That shows the movement of the rebels across the region from late September 2021 to March 2023. Um, so you can imagine that traveling from here, from Goma down here, all the way up to the Bear was incredibly challenging. And that made not only my field work much more complicated, but also logistics and also um, posed a major emotional challenge for, I think, every person who did research or who was in that region at the time. Um, and I think Vogel summed it up pretty aptly when he said that one of the most basic challenges in writing about and researching a place like Eastern Congo is give space to violence and despair without essentializing it. So that means that despite having a lot of violence and despair in these places, there's still a lot of other things going on. And the majority of people decided not to take up arms. Um, so that was always sort of my, my cradle when I was there. And with that background, we're going to jump to Virunga National Park, which recently embarked on a development trajectory that is premised on infrastructure development. And Virunga National Park is located in the far east of North Kivu province, and it actually spans the entire province from the south in Goma to the north, where it straddles um, the, the next province, Ituri. Um, and similar to the entire region, also Virunga is suffering from protracted violent conflicts, from uh, natural resource trafficking and deforestation, mainly um, because of subsistence agriculture and charcoal production, which is the most dominant source of energy in the region. Now, to counter these dynamics, Virunga has decided to invest in infrastructure. And the park management, park management says that by improved, uh, improved road infrastructure, new industrial parks, and the electricity generated by eight hydropower plants, um, which are intended to create jobs in value chains of the agro industry and improve food security for communities in and around Virunga. Then the second point they claim is that young men of local communities who have thus far enrolled in armed groups that trouble the east of the country will refrain from violent actions as a consequence of better economic opportunities. And the third point that the park management holds is that electricity is supposed to provide clean energy and replace charcoal as a dominant source of energy and new jobs are envisioned to help reduce the pressure of natural resources, on natural resources. So keep in mind, this is what Virunga National Park claims. And these projects are largely funded by the European Union and foreign private investors, such as, for example, Howard Buffett, the son of Warren Buffett. And with that, we're going to Ivingu, my field site, which is a tiny little village on the foothills of the Albertine Rift in Central Africa at the edge of the Congolese rainforest. And this is where Virunga built one of their hydropower plants. Now, prior to the arrival of the hydropower plant, uh, Virunga um, Ivingu was about a day's march from the next road infrastructure. So it was only accessible by a narrow footpath through the rainforest. Um, and much of the surrounding of Ivingu still looks like this. And I brought some pictures. So this is how you move between villages in and around Ivingu. 
And as you can imagine, this makes it incredibly difficult for any authority, outside authority, to control this place, simply because it's really hard to reach. And that resulted in a very strong sense of local autonomy. So that was a really strong desire among the community, which is actually common across all of Eastern Congo. And Virunga built their hydropower plant there, and they also built 15 kilometers of road infrastructure to reach that place. And thereby, they created an infrastructural frontier. And what you can see here is the camp of the hydropower plant is here, where they have um, some military and some engineers. This up here is the channel of the hydropower plant, which with a small reservoir here and some pen stocks. And behind this hill, on the bottom of the valley, you have the powerhouse where electricity is generated. Um, and up here, up here, you have a small grass airstrip for Cessna airplanes. Um, because Ibingu is still relatively hard to reach, um, and it would take obviously at least two days um, by, um, by, by car, basically, from, from Goma. So sometimes they fly engineers in and out with small Cessna airplanes. And Ibingu is located um, on the right side of this picture here. And this brings me to my three sort of key dynamics that stood out during my time there. And the first one is that it reshuffled local politics. So to understand that, we have to delve quickly into the administrative system and hierarchy of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, so on top, you have a province, in this case, North Kivu, which is subdivided into territories. And territories are the last territorial entity which are part of a deconcentrated state administration. That means that um, you have elected representatives which govern these territorial entities. Now below, you have a chefferie, which is subdivided into pugments, and so on down to the village level. And these are not part of a deconcentrated state administration, but of a decentralized customary hierarchy. And they are governed by customary chiefs, uh, local chiefs, which usually come from Utokton, Famille Royal, royal families. Um, and they are the traditional guardians of the land. That means that land is not private property, but land is communally held and is administered by um, a traditional chief. And when you want to lease a piece of land, you would go to the chief and he would assign you a land plot and then you would pay him royalties, mostly in kind, a goat or a chicken, and then part of his of these royalties are then directed upwards in this hierarchy. Um, and then you have regular meetings on the Chefri level where a council of elders would come together, together with all the other chiefs of the, chef, of the Chefri, and then you would discuss what to do with the money. Um, and apart from that, um, local chiefs are also responsible for settling disputes over land, resources, and power. Now, with the arrival of the infrastructure project there, um, there was also a huge influx of people from the entire region. And that resulted in a dynamic that, um, this is what I just explained, uh, that the local chief made some of his land available for sale. So he thereby abstracted it from the customary system and made it a private property. And this commodification of land resources partly transitioned, transitioned land from a customary capital, where it constituted an integral part of the customary, of customary beliefs, to an economic asset. Um, and this was sort of exemplified in one quote from a villager who says, to get the field is a matter of seeing people who have large areas, and he's referring to private landowners, and see if they have a small hill, and then you're going to give 100 francs congolais. Here at home, one field per year, we give a goat or a hen or a rooster. But on the fields where we give hens, there they can chase you away at any time. 
So what he says is that customary chiefs have begun to chase or to revoke land use rights from people in order to sell it to private landowners. And villagers then decided to not lease land from customary chiefs anymore, but from private landowners, and thereby also their rents are going to private landowners, and they're not going into, they're not staying in the customary system. So in that way, the whole customary system became completely degraded. The second aspect that stood out was a source of uh, resource extraction from here, mainly through agriculture. Here we see a woman which is um, clearing land, so she's clearing the primary forest in order to cultivate the land afterwards. Um, also, a lot of businessmen came to Ivingu and bought land for timber extraction, and that land is then transported to uh, larger cities in the region. And we also saw an increase in gold mining. This is a gold mining pit close to the river. And what you get at the end looks like this. So you have a piece of gold or some sand of gold here. Um, and with all that, we haven't spoken about what happens to the electricity. Um, so all the, re all the villages around Ibingu were still not connected to an electric grid. And why is that? Because the, the National Park, Virunga, they asked for a price of $153 for a simple grid connection. Now, when you live of 25 cents a day, you can imagine that no one can actually afford that. Um, then the next plan was to connect that grid to larger cities in the region, but they didn't get the concessions. So now what do you do when you have 14 megawatts of electricity in a very remote place? What you're looking at is a Bitcoin mining farm. So they started to mine Bitcoins there. And this was partly funded by the European Union. Um, and that brings me to the third aspect that stood out, and this is the rebel frontier. Um, so I brought this aerial shot of Ivingu. So you have two more villages, Mansamba, Kambale, and Sumbo, um, which are located deep on the forest. You have the electric powerhouse with um, the Bitcoin mining farm here, the camp with the military and engineers here. This is the, uh, the airstrip. Um, and this is the road that goes all the way up where it meets Kiali, which is the next road, which leads to Lubero City. And right here, at where the one road meets the other, we have a Mai Mai camp. So Mai Mai is a local rebel group, and they certainly did not choose that location out of coincidence. But by controlling that region or that node of infrastructure here, they can control the entire transport um, that goes in and out and the entire economic circulation in and out um, to Ivingu. So that is actually the main source of income for almost all the rebel groups in the region. They don't, they tax basically everything um, and mainly by controlling infrastructure. So everything that moves along roads in Eastern Congo is taxed, literally everything. Um, and it's taxed by either the military or rebel groups. Um, and this is also, why would you control a territory that is so difficult to control because of, uh, of a very difficult terrain, basically, um, when you can simply control infrastructure and you can, apply, you can control the entire supply chain. So this is really the principal source of revenue for, for rebels. Now, what stood out in the Bingu and what was exceptional is that they did not only control the infrastructure, but they also started building infrastructure themselves. So we have one rebel down here who supervises this construction site, which is a forced, basically forced labor, um, where they forced the surrounding villages to work for them and to expand the infrastructure that has been built by the national park. Um, and why did they do that? Because um, with that, they increased, again, circulation in the area, economic circulation, extraction of resources, and that was taxable income for them. So rebels would hardly go to a mine and tax a mine or control a mine. They control infrastructure. Um, 
And infrastructure, in the case of Zindu, also enabled them to control the population more directly. Um, for example, um, they went into the village, in this case Ivingu, which was close to the road. Um, they assigned one villager and handed him, let's say, 200 tokens, and each villager had to come to this villager and buy a token. A week later, the rebels would come again and control each household um, for tokens. And if you don't have a token, you will get punished um, by the rebels. So this is an additional source of income for rebels. And it's, in my opinion, closely tied to making this place accessible via infrastructure. Um, and with that, I want to close my talk, um, coming back to the idea of also maybe a authority or frontier authority, or authority frontier, um, with showing that infrastructures also a frontier of authority, which is sort of exemplified um, by this quote from a woman in the village. And she said, when there is war, and she was pointing to the hills of the Vero, before going to hide in the forest, we prepare some food. For the ch um, we prepare some food, the children eat, and then we go to the forest. The, rebel move, the rebels move mainly at night. We left the forest around 10 a.m. to come and get food to eat during the day. After eating, we went back to the forest again and often there was rain. These are places where there are thorns and we seek where there is shade. And that is where we are hiding. There are no houses, we carry bags. So she actually explains that by moving away from infrastructure, she's also able to elude control of, in this case, rebel groups, but you could say more general authority. And with that, I wanna thank you for your attention.